and gentlemen. Um, we've had an interesting day so far. <laughs> Our topic is quite um, cross-cutting, multidisciplinary in nature, because we are looking at uh, the whole spectrum of IP. We are looking at generation through protection, through exploitation, commercialization, through enforcement. And uh, we are not just looking at how to manage IPs in our businesses. We are looking at how to effectively, the key word is effectively, manage uh, our IP assets for business growth and competitiveness. Um, fortunately, we have a panel with diverse backgrounds, very experienced in their areas. Before we continue, I would want each one of them to introduce themselves to you. So, Randa. Thanks, Tara and the IPR team. Happy to be here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm a chemist by education, and uh, I started my career as a patent specialist for pharmaceutical companies in Saba and Co-IP, and then switched to FMCG, working uh, as a regulatory affairs specialist, but focusing on IP, where I championed the technical IP program, currently working in regulatory consulting for food and beverages. Thank you, Randa. Kapu? I'm an IP attorney from India. I have my own firm under the name of MK Midline Associates. I'm majorly litigating into trademarks and designs in India. Janice? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Janice Tejano. I'm from Manila, Philippines, and I'm the director for intellectual property of a private college, De La Salle College of St. Benilde. I told you, we have someone from industry. We have someone from legal background, and then we have from academia as well. Myself, also from litigation and a bit of policy as well. Um, I have been introduced as a senior partner, a lawyer, intellectual property consultant. I have had the opportunity to work with businesses, both large and small, private, public, international, local. And each company or each business has its own way of managing its IP. Whether I can to say whether one can form a benchmark for the other, I cannot really tell. But there's a, a, a trend that uh, we see or we come across in terms of uh, management and the size of the businesses. We know that with uh, small businesses, you don't really come across businesses with uh, IP strategy and policy, unlike the larger businesses who have well laid down structures. Mm -hmm. You also come across smaller businesses who are quite in innovative. They come up with superior innovations, and yet they are not able to diffuse their technology. You find larger companies with less superior innovations or let's say quite inferior um, innovations or inventions and yet they are able to diffuse the technology and they capture the market. What have they been doing? What is it that they do that works for them? Whatever be the case, each business must have its own style of managing its IPRs despite the challenges. A small business will say that they have less resources, and so they are unable to utilize their IPs. They think about costs of protecting IP instead of uh, looking at the final benefits. You find um, small businesses complaining about a whole lot of issues, the market size and all that. How do they address this? How, what, what, what is the best way to effectively manage the IPRs of businesses? 
for the purpose of growth and to be more competitive. So um, I'll begin with uh, Janice Academia. Has there been any research? What have you been doing in your university to um, manage, help the university effectively manage its IPR? Mm -hmm. How do, and generally, how do uh, universities or academia, talking about tertiary institutions and research institutions, how do they manage, effectively manage IPRs? Thank, Thank you. you, Sarah. I'll be happy to share um, some insights from our jurisdiction on that. Okay, so in the Philippines, um, my uh, institution in particular, we are not a science and technology institution. We're actually an arts and design school. So I, I heard Pete uh, this morning mention about, you know, um, it's not just about patents, but actually design is very, very important. But to answer your question, um, I think it's very important the first step, be, even before you go to management of IP, is you have to know what assets you have. So one of the key things that my office did for the institution is we have to conduct an IP audit. You know, so as a school, there's actually two roles that we, we do. One is we manage the assets of the school itself, the trademarks of the school, um, the business processes, trade secrets, and all that. But the more challenging, and I find it more important, is that we really also need to look at IP education in terms of teaching students and faculty. Because um, at the end of the day, it's the students, it's the faculty that are really the innovators. They're the creators, right? And, well, the school only has... Um, you know, such number of assets that it will manage. But the important thing is that we are aware what the different academic programs produce. So like what I've mentioned, since we are an arts and design school and we also have information technology with business platforms, we do game development and design, we do animation, we also have computer application programs. So we, it's important that we are aware what kind of innovative work our students do. And once we have that in place, we have a baseline data for that, then now we know what strategies we can adopt as an institution. The other thing is that um, the very important uh, factor that we consider is collaboration. Um, you know, when, when, when you want to manage your IP assets, this cannot just be an internal um, effort. Um, because, as you, as you know, of course, the students cannot only learn from, from class. It, it's very important that they also know what innovations they need to do that will actually be useful to the community, to society, to the businesses. So part of our role as an IP office is really to connect with industry. And uh, when we connect with industry, we get to know what's the demand, what does the market need. And from that, we collaborate with them and we work with our academic program so that we align um, the students' innovation to respond to this demand. So, so that nothing is wasted, meaning um, whatever the students would eventually produce will be meaningful, it will be useful. So, so in that way, um, we have valuable IP. We're, we're not just creating, we're not just you know, letting the students, okay, do your own thing or whatever, but we guide them. And one of the tools that we use to do that is we, do, we use IP search tools. So I'm talking about patent uh, search databases. We also introduce them to trademark databases. And you know, these are kids that are you know, very focused on their creative work, but once you teach them the importance of you know, using these tools, they really find it very helpful because at least they know that they don't have to start from zero. There is actually very good data that they can use so that they could filter the work that they want to do. So, so that really helps. Um, I guess the other point is that what has really helped us to effectively manage our IP asset, its assets is also to work with the government. Um, in the Philippines, we um, have also used the TISC model of the World Intellectual Property Organization. So we have our local, local uh, version of that, which is called the ITSO, 
or the Innovation and Technology Support Office. And our school has recently been accredited with that network, which is a 95-member network. And it's very good because we're able to, to see what other universities are doing, and we're able to tap on the different strengths of each institution. So at least we don't replicate. And we don't, you know, instead of replicating, we could collaborate. And we've, we've found that it's very effective to do a multidisciplinary approach. When I say multidisciplinary, we have another ITSO member or another ITSO school that's more on science and technology. So they come up with a product, they come up with a solution, but it lacks the design aspect. So a school like mine can come in and like give really valuable input to that. So basically, it's, uh, it's really more of that, Sarah. Um, we do an IP audit, we assess, we determine what we have, and then from there, we can effectively manage. We do protection measures, we do registrations, and of course the collaboration has to be, you know, continuous. So have you had issues with enforcement? Have you had your IPRs being infringed? And you... Well, luckily, uh, for our school, we have not experienced infringement, although we have been challenged by private companies because um, I guess uh, it's a, it's a good problem, you know, I look at it as a good problem because uh, for our trademarks, like currently, we manage around almost more than 50 trademarks for a private school, and that's a lot. Uh, for a private school with 12,000 students, that can be quite a lot to manage, but um, it, it just shows that while we get um, a challenge from, a, you know, like an opposition for trademark, it only shows that we are at a certain level where we're, we're also we have established a goodwill, we have established a brand, and, and we look at it as a good problem. But, you know, to, to answer that question, we also handle this um, amicably. Okay, so the, the Philippine legal system on IP uh, has a mandatory um, dispute resolution process. So if you can avoid, we, we definitely want to avoid um, adversarial processes, so we try to do it um, um, dispute in a dispute resolution manner. Dispute yes, resolution. yes, that's right. We had that from the earlier speakers. That's right, that's right. Using not uh, ADR yeah. methods. Um, so, um, Janice. Yes. No, sorry. Uh, Randa, I'm sorry <laughs> Randa. about that. Randa, uh, you are in industry. What, have been, what are some of your experiences? How do you effectively manage your IPR from the industry perspective? Um, speaking of industry or uh, factory setting, everyone is aware of the immense and critical role that uh, legal and commercial or purchasing team are doing, as well as the trade marketing team with the marketing properties uh, uh, from protecting logos and brand names. But I want to shed more light on, on the technical or R&Z role, because this part of business is exposed to um, the competitive advantage of the business from the recipe to the uh, innovation portfolio pipe, pipeline uh, to uh, potentially some patented uh, equipment and, uh, and technologies uh, and the me methods or processes as well. So this came the importance of, of the launching the technical IP program, which had several pillars that I will take you through later, but the, the main message is, is to empower and to share awareness with everyone uh, working in, in the industry premises, the factory, be it a market associate or a factory-based uh, associate, even a contractor. Uh, it started with launching an IP awareness uh, campaign. We called it IP, it's your job, to, to empower everyone, basically. And, uh, and we shared some examples of, of how, how can you lose the IP, actually, and, and the potential impact and losses that can affect the business. And in this case, even sometimes with all the good intentions. The other initiatives were uh, IP sharing uh, matrix to make sure that any critical information is shared for a valid and good reason. And this is aligned with the legal team and with upper management to ensure accountability. Another factory related initiatives were the photography policy to make sure that uh, no mobile cameras are allowed. It's only the dedicated uh, a factory camera and uh, how to dispose the images later on so they wouldn't be uh, leaked afterwards for the critical and confidential areas. 
Uh, and lastly, the factory map or factory route where you can visually trace the steps of any potential visitor, even from other sites or any uh, supplier that needs to come to the factory. And this has to be visual to everyone, and it avoids, of course, the confidential areas, including the recipe, recipe batching uh, uh, area. And uh, speaking of the fact that IP is everyone's rule, I was working in a, in a different role at that time. It was in regulatory compliance. And I had a challenge related to IP where we were trying to ship to a registration market in the Middle East. And the relevant Ministry of Agriculture requested us to share the recipe of a product uh, as a prerequisite to the registration. And uh, we, we couldn't register. We tried registering through the ingredients only, but it didn't work. So we had to meet them midway and uh, we share the ranges of, of each component of the product. So, um, like I asked uh, Janice earlier on, have you had issues of infringement of your IPRs? Uh, in terms of uh, in industrial design, we had some imitation of some packaging uh, uh, that we, we had in the market but they were on a very small scale and, uh, and there was no litigation required at that point. So as, and they were as of a less, less grade product than, than what okay. we produced. But uh, can you share your policy on that as well? Your, how, do you, how will you manage the enforcement aspect of your IPRs? Should there be any infringement or should you be challenged? Yeah. What will be your response to that? So basically, um, what we did is encourage everyone to, to highlight or share uh, what they see in the market because at the end of the day, we all go shopping and we, we visit different markets and places. So we're encouraged to highlight any, any imitation, any imitated product or potential infringement, and we bring it back to legal and they would decide on the best way forward for this. Thank you. On this note, Kapil, you are a lawyer. You do a, a lot of uh, IP litigation. What has been your advice to your clients? See, you can share your views on the topic and then let us know what advice you have been giving to your clients in this particular, on this particular topic. The first and foremost thing, the way Janice said, the first thing to manage the IP is to assess the IP. Mm -hmm. like for example, someone has created a patent, a product patent. So there might be more IP attached to that. There might be a design to that. There might be a copyright in the literary work for that product. There might be a trademark under which it will be sold. So first that proprietor should assess his IP, what all is included, so that there is nothing that he misses out. The second way forward is to strategize the manner in which it has to be disclosed. For example, in, in India, under the statute, a design can only be protected if it's new and novel. So we always advise our clients, before you launch the product in the market, you apply for the design registration. Because if you launch the product and then you apply for the design registration, then it's anticipated. Though you will get the registration, but tomorrow when you want to monopolize it and you file a suit, you might face a cancellation proceeding. So it's very important you strategize this in the first go itself. Also, for example, someone has created a patent. So it's very important before he applies for the patent, he doesn't do it, disclose it to the, his investors unless there is an NDA. There are con confidentiality agreements in place. Otherwise, the IP goes out of your hand. Mm -hmm. So it is very important at the first instance itself that you protect your IP. And I feel, being a litigator, the most important thing is to enforce your IP. Unless it is enforced, you can't enjoy the fruits of that IP. There are two ways to look at it. First is, for example, the infringer is also using that IP and you don't stop him. So practically whatever the profit he has generated is the loss cost to you. And this is apart from the brand value which is being diluted. And secondly, what I feel is the other important factor which even Indian courts consider is the delay factor. Where you know that the other party is using the mark or using your IP and still you don't uh, take any legal action against him and you permit him to enjoy that IP for a very long time then the courts are not inclined to grant you injunction on the first date, even at the end of the day, because you permit him to grow for those 10 years. So the enforcement should happen at the first go, where you face the, uh, where you see the infringer in the market, so that you are able to enjoy the, the entire IP in your hand. 
and also for example you first you, when there is an infringer in the market and you file a civil suit against him at times when you send a cease and desist notice at the first go the person doesn't take that seriously so once you have a favorable order from a court from a competent court in hand and thereafter you send cease and desist notice to all, all third parties with the ruling in your favor then it becomes easier then you don't have to file suits against every party who is infringing once you have a favorable order in your favor then all the cease and desist notices will be enough because then that party also knows that there is a ruling in your favor so that is also a very important thing which should be considered to manage the ip so so um from what we have said so far janice you you mentioned it earlier is for us to identify the ips to begin with and then to know what steps to take next how what you want to protect how you want to protect which jurisdictions you would like to protect your iprs and then the issue of commercialization also comes in. How do you commercialize these IPRs? As a small company, as a bigger company, yes, they may have the structures to diffuse whatever they have. But then when it comes to small companies, what is the way forward? Janice, you said you collaborate. You collaborate with other institutions, and that is how, that's the best way for you to um, diffuse your, your, your IPRs. And uh, we, I have come across certain situations like that and, uh, between uh, a collaboration between um, smaller, a small company and a larger company, which to me I found very, very interesting. Um, in Ghana, there is uh, a small company called uh, Letty Art. And uh, this Letty Art is in the digital entertainment industry. And of course, as a small company, it also suffers from the challenges that other small companies face. So how did it overcome this challenge? Especially how to um, make sure that its, its inventions end on the market, end up on the market as, as products of innovation with value. So he, this company decided to license the, the inventions, the digital, the softwares, and all their IPRs to a bigger company, MTN. And MTN had, uses its platform to diffuse these inventions. And in one breath, MTN benefits. And then in another breath, the smaller company also benefits. So this is one example of how some of these collaborations take place. I don't know whether you have come across any such collaborations in terms of, um, of commercializing your IPRs. Rano, Randa, do you have, have you done anything? Kapil, have you come across any form of uh, a strategy for commercializing the IPRs? See, there have been benches between the parties where they have tried to commercialize. So at that time, it has to ensure that the IPs, when there is a venture between two companies, the IP of both the companies are equally protected. Because then there are takeover agreements, there are licensing agreements which are involved. So in that manner, I think, when there is a venture, both of them have to be equally protected. So the smaller company is protected as well as the bigger company. Is that what you are saying? No, I, I meant uh, when the IP is being taken over by the bigger company of that smaller company. Then those they need to protect Correct. before they try Correct. to... The agreements have to be drafted in a manner that there are sufficient clauses to ensure that all the IP is taken care of when the uh, bigger company is taken over the smaller company. Do you want to share some more views on that? Yeah, okay. So, so in our experience, Sarah, um, we, again, like um, our school, the core um, areas that our niche markets is really on design and arts, uh, culture, design and arts. And it's very interesting um, what the younger generation are doing now and how much they know about social media and how, what they're exposed to. You know, you can look at it in a good, in a positive and in, in a negative way. But definitely um, what we try to do is we, we try to you know, maximize all these resources in such a way that they will benefit the students at the end of the day. 
So many of our students, uh, most of them, when, they, when they're about to, to finish their course, they are required to deliver a capstone project or a thesis of, of that nature. And uh, again, we're trying to stay away from the traditional, you know, you do a thesis, you do a project, and it's in a book, and it stays in the library. I mean, gone are those days. We have to stay away from that because we have to, you know, contribute. There, there's just so many um, challenges out there that need solutions. So we take these challenges to the students and to the faculty, and we encourage them, hey, you have to, you know, come up with with research and studies that will eventually uh, be applicable, be industrially relevant. So instead of you know leaving that in the in the library, why don't we look for industry partners who would like to listen and you know try try to really make these solutions. Um, happen. So we, we provide those opportunities, we explore partnerships, we collaborate. Again, I, I keep on emphasizing that because that's really, really very important for us. Like in the last couple of years, that has really paved the way for a lot of successful partnerships for our school. And many of our students even want to take it higher. And again, we, we still support them on this. Uh, when I say they want to take it higher, they want to really pursue it as a business, you know, become entrepreneurs. So, you know, they come to us, they come to our IP office and they say, I think I'm ready to actually market my collection. I'm talking to a fashion design student here. And she would say, you know, I, I got a lot of positive reviews for my exhibit, my capstone exhibit, where I presented a 13-piece collection. And I had some, some viewers who said that my collection is fantastic and I want to take it to the next level. I want to commercialize this. What do I need to do? And then, again, we step in and we, we basically provide these students additional tools. What can you do? You should try to start your trademark, label, you know, the name. It's, it's, it, it has a very good story. Some of them, you know, they, they go to uh, materials development, so they come up with new fabrics. It's just um, how the younger generation today come up with these ideas is just amazing. And it's important that we have, we give them the support that they need for this. Uh, for these endeavors. And I think, you know, schools in the Philippines are really doing a lot of work on that. Yeah. So I think I can just add a point to what Genesis has just said. So one of the other ways which has been frequently used is to license the IP. So normally when we license our patented technology to one of the parties, one of the very important factors which has to be considered is, for example, we have licensed our technology to one party. We have to ensure that all other parties who are using that technology, we take legal ac action against them. Otherwise, what happens is the one who is paying us the royalty also takes up a ground that there are other parties who are not taking any action. So enforcement is very important. That is so. Otherwise, the worst person who is paying you the royalty will also get up one fine day and say, there are three others, you are not stopping them, where is the occasion for me to pay? And you are successful in that because your clients actually protect their IPRs before the infringement takes place. So it's easier to enforce where you have the protection already once, once you have a uh, ip in hand once you have registrations in place once you have licenses in place then you should ensure that the enforcement is throughout the uh, platform we are ready to take some questions from the audience yes questions please yes uh, my question is to janice uh, uh, you are saying that uh, you filed around 50 plus trademarks, right? Uh, so my first question would be, are those unique trademarks or are those same trademarks in different classes? One. Second, uh, why so many trademarks? Because you are in academia. So this is the first time I have heard that an academia files so many trademarks. So if you could just give some rationale to this. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, IP protection is very expensive, right? Uh, I mean, the filing itself is okay, but the maintenance of your IP is a different thing. You have to keep, especially for trademarks, you have to do your third year, your fifth year, your tenth year, you need to do the renewals and all that. Well, um, I, 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 I currently manage, um, I'm part of a school that is, again, it's a leading institution that offers non-traditional courses. You know, we are not a science and technology school, but we are, 
taking prominence as um, an arts and design institution. And we also lead in terms of um, information technology courses with a business platform. So again, we, uh, we, we continue to innovate our courses. And I would like to say that you know, we, we have developed a niche market for that. So we're very particular with our brands because we actually belong to a bigger conglomerate of schools. And part of the IP strategy of um, the network is, is really it's a top to bottom approach, you know. So, so everyone, we, we really protect the brand of the school because, of course, in the Philippines, it's quite easy to, you know, use the same name. And, you know, like um, since we are a tertiary institution, um, basic ed education schools, K-12 schools, can easily um, adopt a similar name, a similar branding. And I guess uh, part of really you know, surviving this competition is making sure that your, your brands are protected. So yes, we do that. And um, because we're also very, we're private school, but we're also very public in a way because we do a lot of collaboration. We work with a lot of corporations as well. So that means we need to, you know, make use of each other's brands. That's why we, we do a lot of trademark. Uh, what about industrial designs? Since you said yours is a design, uh, okay, design school. Yes. Uh, so what about industrial designs? Yes, um, that, that's uh, one of those things that we are already pursuing. Um, you know, in our school, we're, we're quite unique as well because since we are a private institution, we did not adopt the framework of the school owning the works of the students. So we decided to let them own their IP, okay? So... Uh, so you assist them to... Yes, yes, we do, we do. So, so we're very strong on education because we want them to be able to do that on their own. And, and luckily, the Philippine system, you know, is digital as well. So they could actually do it online and all that. So we were able to manage, as on an institution perspective, we manage the designs that are owned by the school. So it's possible that a student output could also be owned by the school, for example, if it's funded by the school if it's a commissioned work, if it's a special project. So those kinds of things, then we, we do the protection for the ID. That's I hope I answered your question. Interesting yep. Thank you. Yeah. A school. Any other questions? Any question? Questions? Any other questions? So um, what we have just discussed here, we have focused on um, identifying your IPRs in the form of an audit, assessment of it, and then you move the next step to decide whether you want to protect and which jurisdictions you would like to protect your IPRs. We are talking about effectively managing your IPRs, so uh, you need to take them strategically, strategically from one step to the other. We have heard from industry how uh, they have protected theirs and the kind of education they gave to their uh, staff members. And then, of course, from litigation also, um, the advice given to clients. And, of course, um, just to chip in this from, from, from Africa, we have a free trade agreement that, has, that will soon come into force. So, in the interest of your business, you may want to consider protecting your IPRs in Africa because it looks like most of your IPRs are not protected in Af Africa. If you look at the data from WIP and other institutions, you realize that you have fewer registrations in Africa. But as the borders open up, you should, you should bear in mind that, of course, infringements are going to take place and at larger scales, unlike in the past where you were dealing with smaller markets, now you have to deal with uh, larger markets. So it's something that, like a food, food for thought for businesses and for lawyers in advising your clients, you could, you could uh, think about that as well. Thank you all very much for your Oh, we, we have one more question, ma'am. Yes, please. I have a question. I'm curious, were you doing uh, surveillance? Were you doing a surveillance for uh, imitation of the food packaging? And also you worked in the pharmaceutical industry as well. So were you doing a surveillance? Uh, making a survey in the market, uh, is there a violation or is there an IP leak? 
So you, you're asking how, how we track the market for any, any uh, infringement, basically? Did yeah, I how you were tracing the market. Okay, so uh, I used to work in Mars, and, and the quality team was, was divided into the in-factory and, and the out-of-factory. It was called quality and distribution. And they would also check for, for defects as well as uh, any, any imitation or any uh, infringement in, in terms of designs or, or brand names or, or uh, uh, yeah, this, this whole uh, marketing properties uh, area as well. Yes. Big Gates, Worth commenting on. You talked about irrespective of whether it's a small business or a large business, large corporation. Um, you know, to manage IP, you look at it differently. But from my world of acting as a general counsel across a number of countries and having operations in various countries, um, trying to manage IP in a uniform way, irrespective of the size of the enterprise, um, fundamentally involved us having a IP register in each of those opcos, operations, and making sure there was a workflow process or a policy around it and training so that we didn't miss dates for re-registration or renewals sure. and the like. So I thought I'll just share that learning with you that an IP register is a fundamental thing that every business should have and, and there should be either a workflow process or a policy around it or both and training as well. And secondly, in terms of managing your assets, we spoke earlier about having an NDA and how that at the outset of an operation is the, uh, sorry, at the outset of a transaction is the, the best way to manage risk. Um, but from my learnings, and I've sat in large corporations across startups on numerous occasions negotiating potential joint venture arrangements with them, um, one of the key things that I could see from sitting across the table was that an NDA is just the start of the relationship, yeah? But having an MOU and making it binding in relation to the IP takes it that further step into the relationship and binds the relationship in a way that an NDA doesn't have the capability of doing because of the timing of the relationship generation, if you understand. So I just thought I'd share that with you and open the floor up for that, those points. Yes, thank you very much. Interesting point. Um, but uh, we should also note that it will also, depends on, it will also depend on the jurisdiction that you are dealing with. For instance, if you have MOU in country A, it may not be as strong as having an MOU in another country. It may not be totally non-binding in one country. For instance, in Ghana, MOU is not a contract per se. It's just a memorandum of understanding between the two parties. So it depends on which jurisdiction. And of course, IPR management in both small and large corporations ideally must be the same. But unfortunately, they have different challenges. For instance, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, a larger company who have all the resources, who have all the clouds, who have the market, and as against the smaller company. And of course, if you have IPLs that you would want to be maintaining at the cost of a certain amount, a smaller company may want to look at it from its core IPLs and its other IPLs. It may want to focus on its core IPLs as against the other. But a larger company can look at comprehensively all its IPLs and protect everything from A to Z. So uh, even though ideally we should have a particular strategy that cuts across, in reality, we may not have that because of challenges, certain challenges. Thank you. In All right. Uh, one more question. Um, this is just a curious thought that just crossed my mind based on what I heard Janice say. Um, a key word, collaboration. So if we look at it in terms of the topic, um, and the focus of the, let's say, the SME is to use the assets for growth and competition. So um, in a situation where um, there is a collaboration, 
but eventually the relationship becomes one of a competitive one. How does that, how do you address the issue? Um, let's just do a very wild um, example. You talked about the fact that your students can own the IP. Um, so uh, what will happen in a situation where it, uh, it gets to a point where the IPs become competitive? Did you, did you yeah. Question? yeah, great question there. All right, so let me expound on that a little bit. So since collaboration with industry partners is very crucial for us in order to give opportunities for the students and the faculty to actually, um, you know, engage with, engage with industry and come up with real world solutions that are, will be useful. So we, we go into collaborative partnerships. Of course, key there is establishing important contracts. We have to put them in place. Normally, we do our due diligence. So we, we technically work like a corporate. We, we work like a legal department. So we do our due diligence and we, we um, look at the background of the partners. We see how important the collaboration is. And then on the part of the students who will be involved, Okay, it's more of a voluntary uh, participation. So uh, this collaborative partnerships where there's really good opportunities, this becomes, uh, this is represented by the institution, not by the students individually. So the school enters into institutional agreements with the partner. That way, we are able to protect students' rights. So, so we let the students uh, work on the project, um, and the students assign their rights to us, okay? Because of course, eventually the students will have to leave the school, they will graduate. So what we have in our policy is that should the student's ideas be eventually implemented by the partner on a commercial um, environment, meaning it could actually generate revenue, then most of our agreements would say that they will need to, to share that revenue to the creators. And the other one is that moral attribution, citation of the students is, has to be there. The students being the creators, the students being the innovators, it has to be, they have to be recognized for that. So yeah, to answer that question very briefly, we have contracts in place. We make sure that the students' rights are recognized and protected. So in a case where the student would want to move further to commercialize, by themselves, do you still request that they assign the IPRs to you or you allow them to own the IPRs? Okay, so, so if the school has, you know, investment or has an invested on the project, so it now becomes a shared IP between the school, industry, and the student, right? So if, um, well, at the onset, these terms and conditions have to be in place we have to be transparent about where this is going so that we are able to manage expectations, basically. Interesting conversation. Yeah. We can go on and on and <laughs> on, but unfortunately, our time is up. Thank you very much. Thank for you so much.